Silver Surfer, Requiem. The cosmic hurricane rips through uncharted space at one million miles per hour, gas plumes extending for a thousand light years in any direction. Deep within the thirty light year wide superwind, clusters containing as much mass as a million stars erupt into explosions too vast for the mind to comprehend. Their cries signal the death of massive stars and the birth of new ones. I am Norin Rad, the Silver Surfer, wielder of the power cosmic, former herald to Galactus, devourer of worlds. I have traveled the galaxy, seen more than other eyes could hope to behold in a hundred lifetimes. But I stare at the sight before me with the awe of a newborn child. Here is the cycle of life writ large, to be born in fire and live in the bright flame of our passions, illuminating the world around us. We live and die in fire, knowing that when we die, we are reborn in the minds and spirits of those who will follow the path we have lit for them across the ages. The path that one day calls all of us home. At the dying of the light. Hey, Stretch, where do you want this? You can just set it by the electropulse modulation system. Read. Sorry, the green flashy machine with the red blinky lights. Thanks. The green flashy machine with the red blinky lights and the orange switches. Or the green flashy machine with the red blinky lights and the yellow smoke rising out of the bottom. The green fla- What? It's just faking you out, Stretch. You're getting too easy to kid, Reed. You ought to try taking your eyes off the scopes once in a while. Hey, here's a good question for you. If you can stretch out everything... Then why don't you just sit in a nice comfy chair and stretch your eyeballs to reach the scope? You know, like one of them cartoons. I... he can't. He tried it once, but it didn't work. No, it worked fine, but it looked so freaky that Sue told him if he ever did it again, he'd spend the next six months sleeping on the sofa. The path of scientific experimentation is always a hard and lonely one. What was that, Stretch? I said... I'm going to have to remember to put a lock on that door one of these days. Okay, fine, I can take a hint. Nothing good in the paper anyway. Hey, Matchstick, don't go too far with that. I want to look in the obituaries. Check if anybody I don't like is in there. Ben, you don't like anybody. Yeah, that's why I like the times. The obit section is huge, you know. I, I said it's huge. Johnny? Um... Reed, you better check this out. There's somebody here to see you. Norin, this is quite a surprise. Yeah, what brings you to the city? I mean, other than the bagels, the pizza, the babes, Ben, the museums, the opera, the new fall fashions. Dr. Richards, I, I need to speak with you. Alone. Oh, well, I suppose I can... No, Mrs. Richards. You can stay. But if the rest of you do not mind, this is a private matter. Not a prob. I've taken rejection from all kinds of people. I'll just be, you know, whatever. Norin, what's wrong? So you got any idea what the heck's going on in there? Stretch hasn't come out in two days. No, they haven't said. I ran to the Sue getting him some food, but she didn't say anything, and, uh... And what? She was crying. Crying in that way where it just falls. Like water. Like she'd been crying all day. Like she might never, ever stop crying again. Yeah, well, it, uh... <sighs> yeah... You don't think anything's wrong with the walking bowl and trophy, do you? I don't know, Ben. I don't know. Norin, I know the pain must be excruciating for you, but I... I need to run the tests again. I need to be sure. I understand, Richards. Do as you must. Sue. Sue! 
sorry. I, I fell asleep. What time is it? A little after nine. A.M. or P.M.? A.M. Did you finish rerunning the tests? About an hour ago. And? The results are the same. There has to be something. There has to be something we can do. I wish there were, Sue. God in heaven, I wish there were. But the force that created his shell, that protected him from harm and age and cosmic rays and... Anyway, it's thousands of years ahead of anything I can even begin to understand. There's nobody with that kind of knowledge. Nobody who can... Damn it, Sue. I did everything I could. But it wasn't enough. It just... Damn it! You did everything you could, Reed. You tried. I know, I know. I'm just... I'm just tired, that's all. Tired and angry. Like I could just... I know. Did you... Does he know? He knows. My name is Norin Rad, and I am afraid, not for myself, but for my world, for I have seen the coming of Galactus. And I have but one chance to save my world from his hunger, to save Zenla. I must offer up myself. But there are other planets, other worlds, where no intelligent life exists. Find a world such as that. Do with it what you will, for even ants have a right to life. Alas, I cannot comply. I have not the time to seek such worlds. Had I a herald to probe the universe for me, then many worlds such as this would I spare. But there is no such one. Stop. I beg you to hear me out. If a herald you desire, then a herald I shall be. Let me probe the heavens, scan the starways, roam the endless cosmos for you. All this will I do if you will but spare my people, spare Zen La. Your words are spoke. So shall it be. Harold, prepare yourself. Prepare to be reborn. Thus was Norin Rad erased and the Silver Surfer born. A birth cry that would be echoed in the screams of a thousand murdered worlds. I had hoped to lead Galactus to only uninhabited worlds, but with my memory and conscience erased along with my name, we traveled from star to star. Worlds fell. Billions died. Civilizations were extinguished as suddenly as a child blows out a candle, and with as little remorse. Then came Earth, and something in the spirit of her people touched me in a way nothing else had. Their stubborn nobility in the face of certain death shamed me. They refused to be beaten down like tall grass beneath a storm. Four stood alone against the terror that was Galactus, as once I had done. And in so doing, they awoke what little remained of Norin Rad. In that moment I turned against him, and we arose in strength in that most desperate hour. The price paid was terrible. But for the first time, Galactus was turned aside. On that day Richards returned a little of the mortal Norin Rad to the Silver Surfer. From that day to this, I have seen things, done things, that are nearly beyond imagination, things that would fill a thousand mortal lives. I have explored the darkness between the stars, seen the rise and fall of vast civilizations, done my best to atone for my past by bringing words of peace to planets that had known only the language of war, 
all too often without success. But I regret nothing, nothing. And now, and now, Richards was there at the rebirth of Norrin Rad. It is only right that he should be here now, at the other end of that equation. I regret nothing. And neither should you. You have done all you could. I know, but... I know. Do you know what you're going to do? Where you're going to go? If there's anything at all that we can do... I am still deciding. I think I will first take a look around my adopted home. It has been too long since I have simply taken a moment to do that. And then? Then I think I will go to my first home, Zen La. Yes, that feels right somehow. Do not feel sadness for me. I would not have been myself, would not have had even these years true to myself, were it not for you. For that I will always be happy and thankful. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye, Norrin. Godspeed. Goodbye. So, Stretch, now that all the secrecy stuff is done, you mind telling us what in Sam Hill is going on? What did you say to him? I said, The material that covers your body protects you from the cold of space and the heat of stars, from radiation and pain, loss of oxygen, and... It's the most elaborate mechanism ever created, especially given that it's only a few microns deep. But no mechanism... No machine lasts forever, and this one is starting to break down, because it's tied directly into your nervous system. As it begins to malfunction, so will you. The symptoms will be minor at first. Dizziness, confusion, shortness of breath. At times, your abilities may fail you altogether. You may experience brief blackouts. As it worsens, there will be pain. A lot of it. At times, it will feel as though every nerve in your body has gone nova. Then, finally, paralysis. First of the limbs, then the lungs will stop. The heart will stop, and... and I'm sorry, Norrin. I'm sorry. How long do I have? The deterioration is spreading quickly. I'd say maybe three weeks, a month at the outside. I... Richards. Yes? I understand that on Earth there are insects, monarch butterflies, that often live only two weeks. To them, two weeks is a generation. So if I have but a month, then I have two generations of life yet ahead of me. I am blessed, Richards. I am blessed. Thank you. My name is Norrin Rad. The Silver Surfer, wielder of the power cosmic, former herald to Galactus, devourer of worlds. I have traveled the galaxy, seen more than other eyes could hope to behold in a hundred lifetimes. And I am dying. I am dying. I am dying. Okay, fine. We all make mistakes. So how come mine almost always end up looking pretty much like this? Oh, great. Now look what you've done. Do you know what it would cost the city of New York to fix that? I mean, if they actually did that sort of thing. Nuts. Can't find a single part of that thing where my webbing will stick. It's smoother than glass, harder than diamond. It's stronger than the Hulk's breath. Translation? I am so screwed. Well, that'll teach me to mind my own business. All I was going to do was go out and pick up some earrings for MJ's birthday. It was all going so easily. 
excuse me, is this the price or is this a serial number? Because when there's this much money involved, there's usually a deal for somebody's soul going on. And I'd have to be reincarnated two or three times to have enough souls just to afford the down payment. Uh, what the heck is that all about? Oh, some guy stole a new high-tech mech suit the army was transporting somewhere. But it's over in the fashion district, and I don't know anybody who works there, so... Have you considered something closer to your price range? Perhaps a glass kitty cat with Welcome to Miami engraved on the side. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm not impressed. I have seen that gesture before, you know. Sir? Sir, where are you going? Okay, look, this is your last chance to give up before I get rough. I've had a really bad day, and... Nuts. Great, a bus. Why not just open up a delivery surface for hostages? Can't let them get to the bus no matter what. No telling how many people will hurt or kill to get out of here. I don't have a chance in hell of stopping him, but maybe I can slow him down enough for them to get away. Heck, it'll take him at least a minute to snap my spine, so that's good news, right? Oh, well, who wants to live forever? Well, I did, but what the heck. Okay, that's far enough. I mean it. Stop right there. Stop. Right. There. Huh. He stopped. I'd think I actually managed to scare him, except I don't think he's actually looking at me. I think this suddenly got a lot more interesting. You were given a warning. You would do well to heed it. Because between the brutalizers and their victims, there always stands the power cosmic. Whoa. Thanks. I, I mean, I had him on the ropes, but it probably would have taken me another 10, 20 seconds to bring him down, so that was a lot more uh, efficient. Anybody ever tell you that you have the best poker face in the history of really good poker faces? So what brings you to this part of town? I was in the area. The lives of innocents were at stake, so I did what I could, and now I must go. Whoa, whoa, you can't save the city and then just leave. There are rules, you know. We should celebrate. Come on, me and you, what do you say? We could go see a movie, get some popcorn. The sequel to Team America is playing uptown. It's called Team Canada. They fight for the first ten minutes, then spend the rest of the movie apologizing for it. Come on, that was funny. I, I, look, pal, nothing personal, but I can't fly, and I'm running out of things to swing from, so you want to slow up a bit there? Hey, I'm talking to you. Hey. 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 What's wrong? And don't try to say nothing. I've seen nothing, and that's not it. Not that you could technically see nothing, but my point is... Look, something's bugging you. You want to talk about it or not? Very well. Yay! <laughs> it took him less than a second to go nearly half a mile, and ten minutes before he finally figured out what he wanted to say. For many years, your world has been my adopted home, but now it seems I must leave it, never to return. Why? Was it something we said? Was it something Howard Stern said? Because it wouldn't be the first time. My reasons are my own. Look, uh, what I said before, all kidding aside, if there's something wrong, maybe there's something I can do, or... No. Nothing. Nothing. I have been thinking. I have been thinking that there must be something I can do for your world before I leave. I have been here for so long, enjoying its beauty, and confused by the brutality of your people toward one another. You are all the same species. You have the same goals, the same dreams, the same fears. Eat the same food, sleep the same sleep. So you have to go out of your way to divide yourselves, to make it easier to kill one another. Boundaries. Nations, blocks, creeds, names, fashion. You kill one another for a pair of sneakers. Your leaders oppress and exploit you for their own power, and you allow it happily. 
If in so doing they can kill those who you have decided are not like you. You are a race of madmen. Yeah, we get that a lot. I keep thinking that there must be something I can do. Some way I can fix this before I... Before I go. But there is nothing. Nothing. So I thought, you are a human. Perhaps you would have an idea. Me? Do I have any answers for fixing up the world on the kind of scale you're talking about? Well, sure. Uh, well, no, that wouldn't work. Um, and that wouldn't either. Getting rid of all the Menudo CDs in the world would be a start, but still, uh... Okay, now let's work this through. I mean, you're right, there must be something. You could go into other countries and kick out whole governments using that cosmic power. The power cosmic. That's what I said. I mean, who could stand up against that, right? But there's no guarantee that what comes afterward will be any better. Lately, it seems like the next bunch is always worse than the last one. You could solve poverty by going places nobody's ever gone to and come back with more riches than anyone's ever seen. Diamonds, gems, gold. But too many jewels flooding into the market would cause their value to drop until they became worthless, and then you're right back where you started. Except now you've also bankrupted several more countries who depended on those industries and triggered a worldwide financial collapse. You could strand all the world's political and religious leaders in the same place, no food, no water, on the premise that sooner or later logic would prevail and they would work together, ironing out their differences in the name of common sense and mutual survival. Or not. Or you could... No, that wouldn't work. Or... See, this is why we mainly just fight the bad guys one at a time, because it's one thing to stop a bad guy from doing evil, when we can agree on what evil is, but it's something else to try to change how people are. You could... Yeah, no, some people actually like Brussels sprouts. Hmm. I just... No. Okay, since nothing else is working, I have to ask, because I've always wondered, why the surfboard? I mean, don't you think it's kind of, uh, I don't know, hokey? It is not a surfboard. It is... There is a human phrase that covers it. Form follows function. I need no air, no food, no water. I do not need a ship to sustain me. I need only something that will carry me where I must go. Yeah, but why not a flying car or a small ship? Why a board? Imagine the depths of space. Not just miles beneath. Above. Imagine the depths of space. Not just miles beneath, above, and beside you. But whole galaxies. Imagine standing in the limitless darkness between the stars with nothing between you and the universe. Imagine being able to move through that majesty unfettered, unencumbered, free. The beauty, the terrible, majestic beauty all around you. Thus freed even once, would you ever wish to surround yourself with a shell again and deny yourself that beauty? No, I guess not. I see your point. I can't even imagine what that must be like. It, uh... Imagination is not required. You can see for yourself. I can temporarily invest in you a very small amount of the power cosmic, allowing you to experience what I have said for yourself. I... no, I mean, I'm tempted, but I have things to do. Maybe next time. I'm afraid that will not be possible. If you do not go now, you never shall. Because there will not be a next time. No, I can't. But would you mind letting someone else experience this? That would depend on who this someone else is. I don't know, Peter. Is this really such a good idea? Trust me, MJ, it is. This is the one of whom you spoke? Yes, this is a friend of mine. Her name is Mary Jane. Greetings to you. Um, hi. I mean, hello. How should I... My name was Norin Rad. 
As he says it, I'm ashamed that I never thought to ask him his name. I've always seen him as that guy, not a person. I have to fix that some. But no, I can't now, can I? He has explained everything. Yes, but I... Then clear your mind of all thoughts and prepare to experience the power cosmic. MJ, are you all right? I... I... I can see the world's heart beating. I can hear, I can hear everything. Then quickly, before the moment fades, take your place. Think where you wish to go and it shall take you. You will not suffer for air or feel the cold and you will not fall. Go. So, um... You got a deck of cards while we wait? She was gone for less than an hour, but for days afterward, she would try to describe what she saw, what it felt like. I've seen some pretty incredible things in my time, which is why I thought it was important to let her see those things for once. But even I can't imagine what it must have been like. I only remember what she said to me when she came back to me. MJ, are you okay? Are you... I... What's wrong? I was free. I was free. My God, I've never felt anything like that. Thank you, thank you. Happy birthday, MJ. I love you. I love you, Shalabal. I will never leave you. Never. Thank you, I... It was my honor. Now, I must wait before you go. Because of all this, I may have an answer to the question you asked me earlier. And I told him. And much as it surprised me, he agreed. Shouldn't we stay just to make sure he's okay or not right now? For what he's going to let loose, I think the farther away we are, the better. At least, I think so. I hope so. I told him that people can't change what they are until and unless they understand what they can be. Unless they can know it and feel it in their hearts. If he could extend the power cosmic to MJ and let her feel what he feels, let her experience the kind of freedom he has experienced, let her see the world as he sees it, whole, beautiful, with the prospect of peace always at the center of it, then might it not be possible for just a moment to let the whole world feel what that's like? Assuming, of course, that the effort doesn't kill him first, In prison cells where light could not penetrate, in cities and villages where the gnawing ache of hunger was eternal and tangible, in torture camps and war zones and the parliaments of tyrants, in distant places where hope had become a mockery and tomorrow was only a promise of continued pain and suffering, in the thoughts of those who caused violence because they knew no other way, whose own minds were as torn and tortured as those they harmed. For five minutes, they and the whole world knew what it was to be at peace, to be free. Five minutes. It was all he could afford, because more would have killed him. Just five minutes. But whole worlds have turned on even briefer moments. Who knew what fruit his actions might bear in future? The only thing he ever wanted to, was to bring peace to the world. And for five minutes he did just that. How many people do you know who could say the same? Are you all right? Yes, I... I am all right. The power returns to me, and with it, and with it I can feel them. I can feel the whole world, like a, a great sigh in my heart. And in that sound I realize, for the first time, that I too... I'm at last at peace. Thank you. No, thank you. I... Thank you. I must go now. Uh, are you sure you can... I am fine. I... <sighs> Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye. As he rose into the sky, I thought, how sad that we did not know him better. How sad that his voice was heard so little when he had so much to say. Why do we always realize these things when it is too late to do anything about it? I watched him for as long as I could. 
until finally he was lost in the clouds. I never found out where he went after that, or what he did, and I never saw him again in my lifetime. Requiescent Apache, my friend. You've earned it. For what he knows will be the last time. He soars above the breathtaking vistas of the world he has called home for so many years. And his heart aches, not with sadness, but with joy, at the thought that there can be so much beauty of so many different kinds in one single world. They have been blessed, and so was he. And he wonders if they will ever truly understand the extent of that blessing. He ends in the place where he arrived, both most recently and at the beginning. It is appropriate and right that he should now leave from this very spot. Then he hears a voice. Hello, Norn. I'm glad I was able to catch you before you left. Stephen, what are you? Dr. Richards called me because, well... Because doctors always consult other doctors when they find themselves at the end of a diagnosis they can't beat, in hopes that someone else can provide some better answers. Some say a man can be measured by his enemies. Others say you are known by the quality of your friends. If the mix of varied minds who have given their every thought to your situation since they learned of it is any indication, then the quality of your soul is beyond human measure. They have not eaten, slept, or stopped in their efforts, but in the end, I'm sorry. All that we can give you is this. Within this flame burns all the knowledge of our world, all the secrets we have hidden, all the truths we have forgotten, all our songs, all our stories, all our greatness, all our foolishness. It is divided in two parts that which existed before you came, and that which was created after you came, and saved our world from extinction. The fire of that knowledge will merge with you, will always be a part of you. Turn your thoughts to it, tune your spirit to the frequency of our flawed humanity, and you will hear it all. This way, you will always know what you preserved, and what was created, through your kindness. Thank you, Stephen. Norin, I... I don't have the words. I thought I did, but I... I don't. I... I know. The stars look especially beautiful tonight, do they not? I think I shall go and see them now. Goodbye. For eight days he rides the cosmic tides and as he has never has before. Despite the strain of such speed, passing binary stars and pulsars, red giants and the nurseries of stars waiting to be born, he pushes past the pain and effort, knowing that his time is short and getting shorter, and he has far to go to reach his destination. Like a fish swimming upstream to end its life in the familiar waters where it was born, he finds himself drawn across the stars, drawn home to Zen La. But as ever, the path of the Silver Surfer is neither clean nor straight, and runs always through the mechanisms, follies, and passions of war. The Surfer pauses at the tentative touch of another's thoughts, a whispered request. Come, for we have much to discuss. Thank you for answering our call. I am Phil of Linnaeus. This is the call of the Rumati. Yes, now that we can see you up close, there is no mistake. You are a herald of Galactus, are you not? I was such once, yes. Why have you summoned me? You see before you the fleets of our two species locked in battle. A magnificent sight, is it not? 
Each year more and greater ships join the ranks on both sides, each vessel more powerful and destructive than the one it replaces. Each year, you say. How long have your two worlds been fighting this war against one another? The reckoning of days and years varies by time and place and rotation or cycle. So let us simply say that we have been fighting the sacred war for over fifty generations. Our worlds in orbit the same star, fourth and fifth in sequence, and while for ages we could not travel from one world to the other, we were able to monitor one another's communications. We expected they would believe as we believed, would know the maker of all things as we did. We found heathens and heretics. Different gods that were not our gods. Their shrines were not our shrines. So it was quite obvious, you see. We could not allow this blasphemy to continue. If the Rumati did not believe as we did, if we could not make the Lineats believe as we did, then they would have to die. We dedicated generations to building our war machines and the platforms from which we would one day strike. Endured generations of sacrifice as every resource was torn to making our ships, feeding and training our troops and our priests. Because we were monitoring each other's communications, we were able to spy on each other's developments. With the result that our scientific achievements proceeded at the same pace, one with the other, until, until at last, it began. With each year of the war, the holy temple on our world grew even greater, as we expanded it to demonstrate our superiority. The maker of all things would never allow the temple to be damaged, proving beyond question that we were the most holy in this war. That the other side made the same claim only added to their blasphemy, and made us more determined to see this war through to its conclusion. No matter the cost. I do not understand. Your people suffer and die and sacrifice for your cause. Yet here you, the leaders of your people, sit together in comfort. Why? Why not? We are above such brutish endeavors as combat. Our place is to lead, to inspire. Our people want us to live in such comforts. It is a validation of our sanctity. From here we can together watch the progress of the war and speak of matters far, far above the understandings of others. Magnificent, is it not? Why have you summoned me? My people registered your approach on their scanners and requested I speak with you. As did mine. Because our technologies grew at parallel speeds, we are evenly matched. As a herald of Galactus, they hoped that you would have the power and the wisdom to decide which side was true, which side was right and tip the balance, intervening to end the war on their behalf. But I see no difference between you. Which is as it should be. The war will end when it ends, but we are in no rush. We told them we would speak with you. This we have done. You may go now. Here begins the tale of the end of the sacred war. The stranger moved between the fleets, taking away their weapons. They struck back, though they believed they could not hurt him. But to their surprise, 
hurt him they did. Because the weakness, the sickness was upon him. Yet despite his pain, despite all that it did to him, he did not slow, did not stop, would not surrender to the pain. And then, when he had destroyed the ability of the two great fleets to make war upon one another, he made his way first to one of our worlds, then the other. He came to each of our shrines, our holy temples, whose safety and inviolability we believed was granted and protected by no less than the Maker of all things, and proved otherwise proved that there was no greater hand at work than our own, proved that neither side was more right or more holy than the other, showed us the conceit of our beliefs. And in that moment, we also understood exactly what had become of our sacrifices and our sweat and our blood. We understood what they had taken from us, what we had been tricked into giving them. On that day more blood was spilled, but this time it was not ours. This time we would make an end of it. This time we would be free. The sacred war was over, and that day began something greater. The sacred peace. On neither world was the stranger ever seen again. Over the slow-turning years, we learned that he had left the mortal world, that he had died. He would never see that which we built to commemorate his actions, never know our gratitude. But we, we would never forget. Nor would we forget the words he spoke to us before he left. If sacred places are spared the ravages of war, then make all places sacred. And if the holy people are to be kept harmless from war, then make all peoples holy. A trail of silver passes through the heavens, traveling at the speed of starlight. Ships drawn to investigate come alongside, but do not approach further. They pass in silence. Whether their deference emanates from respect or grief or genetic memory, the reason is the same. Universal recognition of a need shared by all species, all races, all worlds. The need, at the end of all things, to go home. Home. Zen La. Home. Norin, 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 Sh Shalabal, yes, my love, your home, be at peace, rest, you've come a long, long, very long way, and, and, shh. Though we have only had a few days in which to assess your condition, it is my, our consensus that there is nothing that our science can do to help you. Which is not the same as saying that there is nothing that we can try, my lady. We discussed this. My lady, if you were to attempt to give back to Norin the portion of the power cosmic you were given, we have no assurances that it will make any difference. And in our considered opinion, it could do great harm. It could kill you, my lady. And I am prepared to take that risk. So what must be done to... Shalabal. No. Listen to me. Though it was a part of my decision, if you believe I came all this way just to die, then you do not understand. I came also to know that you live, to see you 
alive, so that I may carry that vision across with me when the darkness comes. When we die, we take comfort in knowing that those we love will continue for as many tomorrows as the universe can give us. It is a joy. Would you take from me at this hour my last source of joy? No, no, I could not, but... Then live, Shalapa. Live for me and regret nothing. Because I do not regret a moment spent living for you and for our people. Live, live. As word spread of Norinrad's return and his coming death, the people of Zenla arrived in ever-increasing numbers. They came to thank him for saving them and their world and their children and their children's children for untold generations to come. They came to tell him of all the joys he had created, the possibilities that existed because of his intercession. They came to say goodbye. And as they passed and touched his hand, they came away with something more. A touch of something greater. It would be called the Mark of Norin. In years to come, whenever there was anger or rage or violence, the Mark would turn colors to remind them of the man who had made peace, his cause, his life, and who had ultimately died in its service. It was not always enough, but it was enough most of the time. If any man, any living creature, can claim a greater legacy in death than that, let him come forth. They came for days on end, and though the physicians urged him to withdraw, that enough was well and duly enough. Norin remained and took comfort and solace in their words, their tears, their stories, and their lives, for he had saved them all from Galactus at the cost of his own life, and such deeds are not soon forgotten, nor are the signs and portents of that day forgotten, such as the shadow cast by the great machine used by Galactus to devour the worlds he encountered. No! Such memories are ingrained upon the soul, written in the genetic code in images of fire and terror. The terror that such a shadow might come again one day. Norin, what are you... I must go to him. No! I saved Zenla by pledging my life to Galactus. With my life about to end... He may have decided to finish that which he began. If I can turn his wrath from our world to me, then perhaps we can yet. Norin, please don't do this. I... My lady, we have received a message from the ship. It was broadcast on every frequency known to our science to ensure we did not miss it. Galactus says, Norin Rad, come forth. And he did. So it was that Norn Rad, who had known the infinite freedom of space and ridden the cosmic currents across all of time and space, was carried on the backs of his people, no longer able even to walk. In the years Norn Rad had served Galactus as the Silver Surfer, he had seen his master enraged, quiet, sad, even occasionally at peace. But now in the fate that had watched whole worlds destroyed without a flicker of emotion, for the first time he saw grief, and a thought entered his mind from without, as familiar and intimate as a whisper. I do not know that I can save you, but I can try. No, 
To all things there is a time. This is mine. But I would ask a favor. Again the thought came. I know your mind and be at ease. I will never harm Zen Law or allow it to be harmed by others. I would never allow anyone to harm the world that was the heart and soul of the most honorable being I've ever known. Let go of the burden of the flesh, Norin, and be at peace. I'm flying, Shalabal. Do you see me? I'm flying. I'm flying. I am. For the traditional three days of grieving, Galactus remained where he stood as mourners paraded past, and Norin's body was prepared. For Galactus and for the people of Zenla, it would be the first time they had looked to one another without the barrier of fear between them, joined in their shared loss. For the first time, Galactus, devourer of worlds, had a world where he would be ever welcome. Goodbye, my love. Goodbye. Galactus, if you would truly honor he who was my love, and my heart, and my life, then I would ask something of you. Make your request. And she did. Moments later, Galactus' ship rose tearing through the sky toward the stars. And when it had reached the correct distance from Zen La, Galactus kept his promise. The newly birthed star was positioned always to be on the dark side of Zen La, to cast a glow in the night that would remind the world not so much of his sacrifices, not so much for what he lost, as what he gave. The light of hope, the light of love, the light of possibilities. Astronomers on a thousand planets would name this new star, each according to his own world's own myths and beliefs, but only an earth poet of a long ago year summed it up. When he shall die, Take him and cut him into little stars, and he shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. It was at the birth of new stars in the death cries of old ones that Norn Rad began the journey that would be his last a pilgrimage that would mark a new star born in the wake of another that had passed. And I wonder if he knew, or if knowing he would have approved. I hope he would. But although I am the watcher and I see all things, I do not know all things. I can only hope which is right and proper, for that was the gift of his life, to create hope where none previously existed. I know only this, that his name was Norin Rad, once the Silver Surfer, Herald of Galactus, that his actions saved the lives of billions, that he was my friend, and that he shall be missed.